Hi, I'm Rick Snyder. We've talked about this forever. Pizza and pigskin tours, where we eat pizza. We walk around and see a little bit of historical sites and all that. Well, it's finally happening. You can go to my website, monumentalthoughts.com, and see where uh, you know, how you can get tickets. Um, the tickets do uh, include the price of pizza and not alcohol drinks. You pay for your own beer. But we're going to walk around Georgetown, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. I'm going to show you a lot of cool stuff. Then we're just going to sit and talk and eat pizza and, and whatever you want to ask, I'll talk about as long as they don't get me in court. So make sure you come and see the pizza and pigskin tours uh, at monumentalthoughts.com, and I'll be eating pizza with you soon. Hey everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of The Hog's Tie. It is the second week of July, the deadest of dead times in NFL offseason. Uh, so it's an interesting show. We literally had to sit here for about 20 minutes and think of what we wanted to talk about. Uh, but I am joined by Steve Thomas and Jamal Forrest. So we are a uh, full crew here. Uh, guys, how you doing? Hope you had a good week. Am I, is it just me, or did you stumble over my last name, which is the I most did. basic I did. and simple of last well, names on the face of the earth? <laughs> I, I almost said your real name, and I had to catch myself. Ah, uh, okay, because uh. I already had to edit you out once out of It's Just Business last weekend. Yeah, yeah, um, I'm, yeah. I'm doing good, man. I think I told people earlier in the week, because I got my braces off on Wednesday, and I did yes, a show. congratulations. That, thank you. Like I, I truly appreciate these congratulations. Got to tell people all the time. It's supposed to be out after nine months, and these fools kept me in here for three years, like almost three years to the date. <laughs> so um, I tell people like I'm, I'm struggling to get used to talking with these type of retainers because I don't now I talk like I got a lisp and I can't pronounce some words, so I struggle. And people can hear it in the microphone. So uh, I'd be going through hell sometimes, but it, it'll take it'll take some adjusting. <laughs> See, I thought you said bracelets when you mentioned that first. See, <laughs> there like, you go. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I, first of all, I didn't ever notice you wore bracelets. And second of all, I'm not sure what the crisis is. But now I yeah. know you said braces. Yeah, braces, man. So uh, I'll, I'll get used to it one of these days. But right now, it's it's a hassle. I can't even ask my trainer what what did he ask us to do during a workout because he just be like, huh? <laughs> so I got to ask my friends to re- relay relay the message. See, I never had braces. Oh, I was really kind of glad I never had to deal with that. That's a yeah. I got lucky there too. I, you know, I had an option, it's, and I mean, but I, I chose I chose the to pre, to prevent a, a problem from becoming worse by just getting them done now and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have to get them, but then I figured like, why not just get it out of the way now? Because then in like five years, you'll be like, bro. This stuff that you saw five years ago has gotten worse, <laughs> and now and now you got to get the braces now anyway. So, just get it out of the way. Yeah, it would have probably been an even bigger hassle then. Uh, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you one non-team related story. Interesting thing that happened to me yesterday, okay. or no Thursday. I, I was, you know, I woke up and made myself a nice cup of coffee, and my smoke alarm goes off in the basement at six in the morning. Oh, and so I run down there. The basement's full of smoke. The the air vent in our basement bathroom caught fire, and so Hold literally, wait, say it I again. like say it again. What just yes. happened? The the air vent in the ceiling of my basement bath. You know, like your bathroom has yeah. a little like yeah. They can catch fire apparently, and it exploded and was so you like had an bur- actual legitimate smoke detector set off. Then yes, yeah, at six in the morning. You know what? Re- guess what happens? I don't need coffee after that. <laughs> At least it wasn't at 2 in the morning. No, if it was at 2 in the morning, I wouldn't have probably woken up. Because it's all the way in the basement and I sleep. Well, you would have woke up when the rest of the house, you know, caught on fire. Exactly. Exactly. Like, we're actually lucky that I was awake. Because if that happened 
overnight, I'm two floors away. I probably well don't keep us in suspense. So why did this air vent catch on fire? They apparently after a certain age they just go. I didn't know they go like that. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) You know this is it. You know that bathroom was redone before we bought the house twenty years ago. So, you know that that that's probably when it was built was twenty years ago. So it probably just died and exploded. Um, oh, man. But we had to call the fire department. You know, it was a whole thing. Wow! So you I had, had no you had idea. a fire truck outside your house then at six in the morning. Yes, I'm my sure neighbors, your neighbors loved were me. pleased. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't like a it wasn't like a uh, wasn't a huge fire. It was like no. A, okay. Well, but because it was in the ceiling, you know, I like put out the what I saw as the immediate fire. But we called the fire department just because it's like it's in the ceiling. If there's something else on fire, there are loose wiring that's causing it. Yeah. You know. Now you live in a townhouse, bad. right? Not a separate. Yeah. So your neighbors actually ought to be happy that you called the you know, the fire department. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, The immediate neighbor are happy. People across the street probably just annoyed. <laughs> like, what the hell they got going on? They can't cook or something? What's going on? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I hear exactly. somebody over here all the time at, at our house. Or I say at our house. At my house, uh, a couple rows down. Now, I, I, I joke, because I know it's not the case. Like, they have a very sensitive smoke detector. Um, mm-hmm. And, like, every, for a long time, uh, last year, like, every day, if not every other day, their smoke detector is going off anytime they're in the kitchen. I'm like, oh, my goodness, bro. Like, y'all got to do something about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm about to say, it's, it, it was rough. That reminds me of the, the times in the college dorms when someone was always burning popcorn, you know? <laughs> if you if you think back to your college days, anytime yeah. there like once a week it would happen. Somebody would burn some popcorn or something, and it was a pain in the yeah. butt. Um, well, you know we're we're vamping a little bit, I think, because we like I said at the beginning of the show, it's a thin week in terms of topics. We're going to uh, talk about Alex's smoke detector for thirty five minutes today. Yeah, well, you know, at least it's a somewhat interesting story. It's not, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we we've talked about more boring things than house fires. Um, oh, that's true. Yeah, we have. Yeah, yes. Uh, but let's let's talk about Steve. You came up with this idea uh, of kind of what's going to be our topic du jour today, and that is since there's not a lot going on, talk, talking about the big picture stuff with this franchise. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit in the past the name change stuff, especially because you had contact with uh, uh, the guy who's got Martin all those McCauley. patents. Yeah, yeah Mark. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and we've got a couple polls that we've done on our website about the name, uh, some of the name options that have been bantied about. Uh, we, we could talk about the new stadium stuff a little because our friend Rick Snyder did a seven-minute video on his uh, YouTube page talking about stuff that he thinks needs to be added into the new stadium. I think that might be interesting. We talk a lot about where it could go. Uh, this is more about what does a perfect stadium look like for this team. Um, and then, you know, the other, the other thing that we could talk about, you know, I'll probably want to throw some uniform stuff in there, but let's really talk about, and I want to start here, Steve, because you kind of came up with this one, this front office, this coaching structure, are we really building something long-term that will take this team from being, what have they been, a 400 team the last yeah. 20 years? And put them over the top, get them into the regular playoff conversation again. I'm not even going to say Super Bowl. Let's just say they're making playoffs at least 50% of the time. Something like that. 500 frequent playoff visits, maybe a Super Bowl win. Are are they finally building the right direction there? And so, you know, I think it comes in two parts. And I want to start with the coaching staff first because I think that's the real, the, the more pressing question in that conversation. Um, so. Well, first, we're going to do defense. Also, going to do our position group breakdown on defensive tackles. Yeah, we'll do that at the end. Yeah. Yes. So, if you want to listen to that, skip ahead to like the forty-minute-ish mark. Yeah. If you don't care about our babbling. In terms of coaching staff, I mean, I, I'm trying to be very blunt and down the middle, not overly optimistic, not overly cynical, which is my natural, you know, my natural mode. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Um. The problem here is I think we've seen this before to a certain extent. We're always optimistic about the new coach in the first year or so. And then it all goes to hell because this is Washington, D.C. You know, I I mean, I was even for five minutes optimistic about Jim Zorn for, you know, a blink of an eye. 
uh, I think everybody was optimistic about Jake Gruden for a while. Mike Shanahan, I thought, was the answer, uh, you know. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, sure, you, you, I, I think we have a very positive um, outlook on Ron Rivera and Jack Del Rio in particular. But one I've had, and Jamal, you can speak for yourself, but I know you've talked about your issues with Scott Turner in his, in his offense. So there's that. Um, so I guess I am optimistic, but on the other hand, yes, Ron got the Carolina Panthers to a Super Bowl, but he also had a whole bunch of, uh, you know, mediocre seasons in there, and that was with an all-pro level quarterback. Mm-hmm. So I don't – I think it's – the most fair outlook on this coaching staff is there's reason to be optimistic, but it's not time to just celebrate Ron Rivera as the next – the next Joe Gibbs because we haven't seen as much, you know, and, and face it, they got a little lucky last year. Okay. I mean, they won a division at seven and nine and they were seven and nine only because our division was horrible. The division was one of the worst divisions in the history of the NFL by record, uh, you yeah. know? So I don't think that there's reason to be hugely optimistic. I think there's reason to be hopeful but I don't know if I'm ready to crown this coaching staff as the next great thing. I guess that's as fair as I can say it. Um, I, but Alex, Alex asked if we were building things the right way. Um, and and my my direct answer to that is yes. I think we are. Uh, I think Washington is not we, but um, the, the reason from the coaching perspective, uh, you you kind of. Ron is painting the picture or putting like his vision board. Like we, we kind of see what's in place with, with, with Ron. We kind of see what's in place with the team. Um, and, and when he got hired here, Dan Snyder said, this is going to be a coach centric approach. Um, this is, this is mm-hmm. all, this is all coming from the head coach and how he wants to operate, how he wants to move. I'm letting him do his thing. I'm staying out of the way. Um, and Ron, to this point, has built things exactly how he wants. It's taken time. Everything hasn't happened in one all season. He's continued to add pieces this all season. Um, if I have a list of everything, I can probably you know name them off. But I'm not going to sit here and do that because I'm I'm not going to try and remember everything off the top of my head to make my point. <laughs> we, but we can all look it up, figure out everything. The the point to that is as Ron is continuing to build from the coaching side and from the front office side. Um, he understands that there needs to be some type of structure in place. Uh, the front office is going to do their side. His coaches, uh, his main guys, Scott Turner, Jack Del Rio. Jack is obviously always going to be, because of his background um, and his resume, he's always going to be considered a head coaching can- candidate. So as much as he continues to produce statistically with this defense, um, there's no telling how long he's going to stay here because he may want to try the head coaching again. Uh, Scott Turner, like like Steve said, um, you know, you're talking about a guy who still has to prove himself, uh, but this is probably the biggest year for him of his career, his coaching career, because he has all the pieces in place to be successful from a, a weapon standpoint. Like you have, you have a decent quarterback. You have the weapons that fit your scheme as best as they can um, with the running back position and the receiver position. Tight end is still mixy. You know, offensive line is is, is above average. I'm not going to say they're really good or great, but they're not bad. So I'm saying above average. They're competent. Um, you have a you have a you have the, the pieces in place to be successful on that side of the ball. Um, obviously, schedule wise, when you're playing other teams, there are going to be challenges for these coaches and Ron Rivera. Uh, but when you're talking about growth and chemistry and development, these guys are finding the players that fit their scheme. And when we're asking if, from the coaching perspective, if they're building things the right way, I would say yes. Um, er- they're getting people in place that fits what each side wants to do. Uh, and, and they're finding their guys for this defense and for this offense <coughs> that can work long term. Um, so, you know, we'll see what it what it does in, in terms of production on the field. But... Uh, I can't say that you know what I'm saying they're they're building they're not building things um, properly. I can't say that. I think I think that they are, and I think they're trying. Um, so that's that's kind of where it goes from there. I, I mean, maybe I didn't answer the question. Uh, you know, if if he was if Alex, your question was, are they building properly? I mean, 
I think so for the most part. Now, uh, you know, we'll see where where we go. I mean, the 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 quarterback question is open. It, you know, the right thing, the best thing, and the most ideal thing would have been to find the quarterback in year one. Uh, you know, now we're in year two, and we've got Ryan Fitzpatrick. So I think that is an open question. But in terms of everything else, I think they're sort of building the right way. I mean, Ron has put um, money aside, money and status aside in favor of the people who can really play, and that's the way to go. So I'm optimistic in that regard, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, when we talk about building, I, I've said this many times. Uh, it's very easy for a coach to build his team year one, year two. Uh, because he knows who he wants, who he doesn't want. The hardest thing is year five, year six, when the guys you targeted as your guys don't work out, are you willing to cut bait for somebody else? Because uh, that's, I think, what killed Mike Shanahan. That's what killed Jay Gruden, was they kept favoring these guys that they were loyal to, even though production didn't match loyalty a lot of the time. And it, that it, that hurts them all the time. It also... If you go back to the early 90s, is what caused Joe Gibbs to retire. If you sure. want to be fair about it, because, I mean, I know Jamal was sort of probably before your time a little bit, but um, when Joe Gibbs retired, which was, what, the 1993? 90, yeah, after the 92 yeah. season, all those guys, the Hogs were getting old. Yeah. Mark Rippon was getting was sort of washed up at that point. The receiver core, you know, was getting old. He was right. going to have to start over, really, and replace those guys. And I don't think he really wanted to do that. I'm not criticizing him for it. Obviously, he was the greatest coach in franchise history, and I, in my opinion, one of the greatest coaches ever. But that was at the point where Gibbs was going to have to do what you're talking about, cut bait with yeah. a lot of those guys, and I don't think he wanted to. So and, I, I think that happens to everybody. Oh, it does. Uh, but, you know, doing it in year 10 versus year 5 is a big difference. You, like, Absolutely. To get yeah. to year 10. And he got to three Super Bowls. I'm not criticizing yeah. it anyway. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying that's that was, I think, what motivated Joe Gibbs to retire in large part. Sure, sure. I, but the point is to have that kind of long-term success, success, you need to do that year in, year out for, to a large extent. And we're seeing it so far with Rivera, uh, but again, we're still so early that he's he's really just still purging this roster of guys who were here that aren't either fitting his scheme or aren't they're underperforming. You know, you can't clean house in one year in the NFL. It takes two to three years to do that. Now, I am legitimately concerned about the quarterback position, though. Oh yeah, and I, I think, think that's that, a huge concern. I think that'll define him, like like most coaches, that'll define them. Um, you're talking about a guy who <laughs> I laugh every time I think about it. Like you're talking about a guy who's on his fifth quarterback and only his second season. Like his second season, his second season haven't even started yet. But you're on Ryan Fitzpatrick, and you've went mm -hmm. whether it's your fault, your fault, or, or nobody's fault. Like whether it doesn't matter. You're on your fifth quarterback, um, and you haven't even started your second season yet. The thing is, you can't keep saying. You will eventually get your guy. You can't keep thinking that you will eventually get your guy. You can't keep uh, holding out hope that it'll happen. You have to make that move. Um, and you're not going to be able to develop a long-term anything if you're dealing with a 30, 35, well, 35, okay. You can argue you can get somebody for like three years out of that. But 37-plus-year-old quarterbacks... 37 year old plus quarterbacks like you can't you can't do that and expect uh situations to improve long term when you're just strike you're hoping for lightning in the bottle um and that's just not how things work when you're trying to when you're trying to build something um i'm not saying it's easy to get the 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 rookie standout i'm just saying if you don't identify your guy whether it works or whether it doesn't, but you have to identify your guy and you have to bring them in here and you have to be aggressive to get these guys. It doesn't matter like what placement you are <laughs> in your in your draft order. Make it happen. Get your guy. Make it happen. Um, and and if you fail to do that, then especially if if you're on a five year contract to this point, you're approaching year three and you don't have your like we we know that they're not getting another quarterback at right now. It's either Taylor Heineke or Ryan Fitzpatrick. Um, but you're going to be approaching year three without a definitive answer at quarterback. Like, that's just a matter of the fact. 
Like, so you I need mean, to figure out what you want to do. Yes. Um, my my thing about that is, look, I wasn't a Matt Stafford guy. I I don't like quarterbacks who are that immobile. Like, I, I need to see something from a guy. But they went after him. He was their guy that they wanted, and it just didn't work out. I am happy that when that didn't work out, they didn't go make some kind of desperation move. Uh, you know, trading a buttload of draft picks for a rookie, uh, trading a buttload of draft picks to, thank God we didn't go for Deshaun Watson, you know, uh, with all his trouble that he's in now. They they held on, they saved their bullets, so to speak, and, you know, they're, they're going with a, a guy who maybe he's not elite. But you can at least get through the year with them, I think. Uh, you can keep trying to see if Allen or Heineke have anything, uh, you know, behind the scenes, which is what they seem to be doing. Uh, wait till next year or next offseason. Hope you can find somebody. I, now, if, if next year they are like, well, we retired Ryan Fitzpatrick. Now we're going to go after Aaron Rodgers because he's a free agent and he's 39. That that Then I'll be very concerned. I mean, uh, you if know, you look at the history of successful franchises in the modern NFL. Let's put Washington aside. Sure. Because what Joe Gibbs did with three different quarterbacks is very unique. Um, Mike Tomlin with the Steelers. Ben Roethlisberger was drafted in 2004. Tomlin came to the team in 2007. So he, he inherited right. an all-pro level quarterback. Um I think it's fair to say that Belichick and Brady grew together. I, 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 I think Belichick was there before Brady, but it was, they were in the first couple of years both together. Mm-hmm. The Giants and Eli Manning. Eli Manning went through several different different um, went through several different uh, head coaches. Peyton Manning came in early in. Um, I forget. Uh, Peyton Manning Dungy. went through. The thank you, Dungey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there was something so I don't, before Dungey with Manning, wasn't there? Yeah, Peyton Manning went through a couple different different coaches. Yeah. I guess my point here is that it doesn't need to mirror up exactly year one coach, year two, <laughs> year one quarterback. No. But I think once we get to about year three or so, he's got to find somebody, meaning Rivera, because at that point then, if you start over with a rookie – this rookie doesn't play well in year one, you know, well, now you're looking at Rivera being a lame duck heading into year five, well, you know, and that's when guys get fired. And so I think he's got really sort of next year to figure it out. I think so too. Um, and, you know, on the thought of Rivera in year four, Rivera in year five, uh, one thing people, I don't know if people are considering this or not, Rivera is almost 60 already. Uh, and in the NFL, you know, coaches can go a long time, but I think Keith Carroll's the oldest, and he's sixty nine. Uh, it's not, and you know, no, he I think sta- he's older. Stuck around because he has had some success. Ron Rivera was born in January of nineteen sixty two, so he's fifty fifty nine right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'll he'll be sixty by the end of this next season. And he has he's just recovering from cancer. Is the sure, there is that. Although he's recovered, thank God. So, um, but my my point being. What is what is in the tank for Rivera? Let's say he does find a quarterback. Is is this a ten year thing for him? Is this really just five and maybe a couple more? You know, like he's not gonna. I don't think you'll see him be Bill Belichick here and here for twenty years, or what? You know, however long Bill Belichick. He's been in New England forever now, um, but that's rare in the NFL. Guys usually only stay at one spot for a decade anyway, uh, at best. So I think that's going to be a big factor in this whole discussion, at least in my mind it is, is, you know, Rivera's already at that point where you might even start to, talking about, well, are you grooming somebody underneath him to eventually take over? You know, that kind of question. And and Belichick is 69 years old. Oh, Belichick is 69 too? Okay. Yeah. No, well, oh, he's 10 years older than Rivera. Rivera is 59. Belichick is right, right. 69. So right. Belichick, yeah, I mean, he's a bit but of a he's unicorn. also won a million Super Bowls. He can do what he wants. Yeah, <laughs> he's a kind of a unicorn. Yeah. I, uh, think, I mean, it's a valid question. Go ahead, Jamal. Sorry. No, nah, you're good. I, I was, I get what you're saying, Alex, but I, I think at the end of the day, that don't even matter if, if Rivera isn't performing during his first, his first contract 
uh, oh sure due to like he has again like Steve said three third third year is going to be you know pivotal for him uh, for a variety of reasons but I'm not even worried about how long he can he can coach or even if how long he wants to coach if he can't even perform after this like I, I know the optimism optimism exists for for obvious reasons I even said that I think that they're building things the right way but uh it's it goes much further than building like you still got to produce and you guys already hinted to it like they got lucky as hell last year um that's not their fault you know they can only face who's in front of them they can only face who shows up on game day uh for the other teams but are you going to expect that type of luck to carry over into this year without you know i mean expecting that all of the talent that and, and elite teams, elite players that you're facing this year is going to somehow magically disappear and get hurt. I, I, I'm not banking on it. So, yes, he has to produce. He has to produce from win from a win loss standpoint. Um, and I that goes into how long. Like if he can't even make it out of this 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 first contract, assuming I mean technically we know like the fifth year. Like if you're on your fifth year anyway, that's a lame duck status. Um, so like your first four years. If you can't, if you're not winning out of that, you know, then that's a problem. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about how long he's going to be coaching until we can see some production this first contract. Then we could talk about, all right, how long can we really keep Ron? <laughs> yeah, um, yes, you're right. That I think you're sort of taking the same general mindset as I am, Jamal, which is that, I mean, I'm trying to be optimistic, but I'm. I, I get the feeling a lot of fans are sold on him already, and you know, a few, you know, the uh, Super Bowls in the future sort of thing. And I just not, I don't think we're there yet with him. He's got a lot to prove. Um, last season was a bit of a, it was a bit of a mirage. There's no doubt about it. You know, so this year is a turning. This year and year three are a turning point. If it doesn't happen by year three, we're gonna, you know, the Wolves are gonna be out the door again. You know. <laughs> Oh, for sure. And, you know, I think so much depends on that draft. Uh, it, it, the quarterback situation is really going to be the trickiest part of this whole discussion because for you to sustain success, you really can't plan to also to start a rookie quarterback no matter where you draft him. Just, I mean, if you look at the numbers, rookie quarterbacks still struggle more than they don't. So, like, he has to hope that Ryan Fitz, Fitzpatrick can be here another year almost just so he has somebody start while the rookie sits and learns or whatever it is that they do. Uh, you know, because you don't want to just bank on one guy at, at that position. So that's going to be very tricky, I think. Uh, because if Fitzpatrick retires, then you're going to have to find another veteran, and you know how tricky that gets. Well, the ironic thing is, uh, you know, is if Fitzpatrick does fairly well and at least gets the team up to, you know, like a, I guess I was about to say 9-7, and seven, you know, but – you know, Let's say nine, seven, and one. <laughs> yeah, you know, something like that. They're not going to be in a position to draft a major franchise quarterback without a huge trade up. You know, so it's um, it's almost sort of a catch twenty two in terms of where the team can be if Ryan Fitzpatrick does fairly well and then all of a sudden retires. Yeah, that that's a that's also very true. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, and you know we're so far from that point i guess that that and you know that there's a lot of speculation that's gonna have to go in to how they do and all that kind of stuff while we're talking about this part i, I do want to switch gears and let's talk about the front office a little bit uh you know this whole jason wright era uh i think it's fans have felt good about it at the start uh like i think he had a heck of a honeymoon period last year but uh, am I weird in feeling like you're start? I'm starting to get a sense that people are like, okay, y you got everyone's opinion. Give us a name. Get a stadium done. Like people are starting to want to see stuff done. And you know, I, I think it doesn't feel like they've changed gears to start going up that hill. <laughs> At least from the outside perspective. I, I'm. It's to me. It's just refreshing to see someone in charge who has respect for the fans who seems to have a plan and uh, is competent because we haven't had that in Washington for a long time with the Bruce Allen era and the Vinny Serrato era and 
whatever it is Dan Snyder does <laughs> or did or sure. whatever. And just just that alone. And in terms of the stadium, I mean, people just don't understand how stadium development deals are done. I mean, they have about, you know, if, if, if the idea here is to get a stadium online be either 2027 or 2028, they've got realistically, I mean, construction will need to start by about 2025 or so. It's going to take two years. Plan on two years for a right. build. And so they do have a couple years to get this done. And it's not a crisis mode yet. Um, uh, so it's not something that needs to happen tomorrow. Fans just want it to happen tomorrow because they're impatient. You know, so I, I'm very optimistic about Jason Wright. And I think that, yes, probably Dan Snyder is making an effort to bring a diverse group of front office leaders in but i I, i've never cared about that more than i care about are you competent are are you good at what you do and regardless of what gender and color these people are they're all good at what they do and and it's made a tremendous change in the way the team acts and the way the team is led because of jason wright julie donaldson and these other people so uh, you know what category you fall you know you fall in is much less important to me than what you're doing and I, I like what they're doing yeah um the best the the best thing when undergoing significant changes is uh incorporating or establishing the transparency um from both sides like you you're taking in what what people are are offering in terms of whether it's criticism or advice or suggestions but you're also uh communicating whether it's bi-weekly uh quarterly semi-annual whatever 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 decision you may be but as long as you're sticking to it and you're letting people know what what you got going on what the process is what the progress is what delays you've encountered what uh uh roadblocks you've encountered what uh new ideas or whatever as long as you're expressing that you know, I think that's the making of a good uh, businessman, but also um, a, a person who is is for whatever it is that he's for, um, like or f- for whatever it is that she's for. The point is, like when you're dealing with a person like Jason Wright and his team, um, all the people that you mentioned, Steve, uh, the that's all you can really ask for for from a person in his in his seat, because fans aren't gonna know anything that's going on from a business perspective with Washington unless they hear from a reporter who has sources or they hear from the person itself and that's that's who he is that's who he is to to the fans um and and it's a good it's a good thing to to have uh to to have when you're establishing again the change like this and also I give them credit like I apparently he's been around for some time I don't know um, but I've, I've just heard about that fan ambassador thing, probably like May. Um, but it may have been around longer than that, if I'm not mistaken. No, that's around when it started. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So they had something, something dealing with fans, but I, I don't know. Maybe it was just sporadic things where they included fans in, in, in random stuff. I don't know. So they, with, well, remember the thing I did, Jamal, the, um, like that yeah, two they, hour they, meeting Jason Wright did. It, it, he was doing that kind of stuff informally with fans and podcasters and okay. stuff like okay. that. Okay. All right. I'm following that. All right. So it was just a bunch of informal things, but still yeah. included. Okay. I got you. All right. So, yeah. And then they, incorpor- they incorporated that fan ambassador stuff. Um, and that's another way to connect with the fans. Um, so I, I, I understand what they're doing and, and how they're trying to reach out to the people, uh, the, the community people of the, the Washington football team. So, you know, things are, things are good. I like what, what Jason is doing. I like what his team is doing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I don't like what they're doing. I My point is more, uh, it felt like we went a year with a lot of discussions about the name, and then we found out they haven't, you know, like made their first move, uh, which was a little frustrating. Um, but l- let's talk about the stadium stuff, because I wanted to get to uh, what Rick Snyder, you know, kind of posted on his YouTube. Uh, this idea of... Not so much where's the stadium going to be, because I think, you know, we won't know until we know, and we've talked that to death. But what do we want to see in a new stadium? Uh, you know, what experiences? I'm, I'll tell you the things he had listed. 
he said any new stadium he thinks is going to have to have a high upscale experience with 5G wireless networks and TVs everywhere so people can watch other games during while they're at this game. Uh, he, he had this whole idea of you got to incorporate the bouncing seats at RFK, which I think has always been something Dan Snyder says he wants to figure out how to do. Uh, and then he, the one thing he said that I thought was interesting was he doesn't think you need to build a giant empty parking lot like they have at FedEx and like a lot of stadiums have where it's just here's a stadium in the middle of an ocean of parking lot. Because uh, he thinks that the future is, one, you're probably building smaller stadiums, not 100,000-person stadiums, uh, but also more people are taking mass transit in and things like that. So he doesn't see tailgating as being as big as it used to be, uh, which I, I think is interesting. Uh, you know, I would say as a millennial person, when I go to games, I rarely go to anything for tailgating. Uh, you know, I'll maybe like bring Same. a cooler with some beers in it, but I, I don't I'm not going five hours before a game to tailgate. So, you know, that's just me. But yeah. Um, so it was exhausting. <laughs> tailgating. I mean, just the experience of tailgating and then going to the game after after yeah. tailgating. Like you probably are already drunk, probably can't even see straight, and then you gotta sit down or stand up and watch a football game for three hours. Yeah, yeah. I've never been to a tailgate in my life, and I think it's dumb, and I would never do it. I, I'm there to watch a game, and I just go straight in. But that's me, and I'm weird. Um, in terms of the stadium, I kind of disagree with Rick. And by the way, it's Rick Snyder's Washington. Go follow him on YouTube, please. Yeah, um, yeah he's got over a thousand, I think. A thousand. Yeah, I think he does. But um, I really don't care what the stadium looks like. And I've always said that on this show that I think Washington could play in the parking lot of a Piggly Wiggly, and people would show up as long as they win. I don't think it really matters what's in the stadium at all. I don't think it matters what it looks like. I don't think it matters, you know, what amenities it has. I don't think it has to be high end. I don't think it has to be an experience. I think the team just needs to win, and people will be there, and they'll be happy. In terms of the parking lots, um, I mean, if the stadium's way out in Loudoun County somewhere, you're going to have to have a huge parking lot because people are going to have to drive there. If they right. pull off a miracle and put it in the middle of downtown D.C. somewhere, yeah, sure, people will probably take the metro. But it, I think that d greatly depends on where it's located. But I just don't care about a lot of these amenities and stuff. It doesn't matter. I just want to see when I just want to sit and watch a game and have the team win, and that's it. All the rest of that other stuff is just noise to me. Well, so, you know, he, he had one point, and I think it's more of a philosophical thing early on in his comments where he says a stadium has to feel familiar the first time you walk in. And, and his point was, like, Camden Yards – it's got this very comfortable feel. You walk in, there's that red brick facade of that office building right out in the outfield. Now, my, my thing is, you can do that with baseball stadiums very easily because they have a huge opening that lets you almost paint a picture of, like, this is the outside world while you're watching baseball. Football stadiums are typically, you know, it's a bowl. You're not going to see anything but the other fans. So I don't think you can get that vibe right away. Um... Now, my big thing is, you know, when I, and I, I, I'm against the popular opinion, I hate the idea of having a domed stadium. And I know that's they're going to do it. I just hate the idea of football played indoors. I, I, it, to me, that's the definition of un-American, is football being played inside. I so, think they should could not consider anything but a retractable roof stadium. Hey, I was yeah, going to say I, something. I, if we played in Minnesota, you would not be saying that. If we were if we were a team in Minnesota or Wisconsin, well, we're you not gotta, Minnesota. But I, I'm saying I'm saying when you talked about the <laughs> when you had talked about the stadiums just not having like you're a fan of all stadiums not having domes. Um, I Green like, Bay yeah. doesn't have a dome. Yeah, Green Bay. Yeah, that's something they've been used to for a long time. But I don't I don't blame them if they did. Like same thing with Minnesota when they transitioned to a dome. I don't blame them. I, I just, I just, I'll just say I understand because those are just temperatures that no normal human being should be outside dealing with <laughs> at all. Well, peop maybe you should stop having people live in those temperatures. <laughs> right I, hey, I'm with, I'm with you. Like, if that was the case, you know, some people, some, some people get used to it, you know, but just yeah, having know, to I deal know. with it outside, uh, uh. No. They have to have a dome. It's crazy not to put a retractable roof on. Just nuts. 
and one of the reasons why it's nuts is the odds of the NFL giving you a Super Bowl without a retractable roof oh, in a winter climate. And granted, yes, they did it in New York once, but um, that's it. It, it. They they're gonna have to have a retractable roof. And I don't. I think it's just dumb to make people sit outside in the snow. That's stupid. You know, make them comfortable inside a dome with the roof. Uh, it'd be much better for everybody. It makes everybody soft. It, climate control <laughs> has made America weak. First of all, all fans are just sitting there in a seat. It's crazy. Uh, you know, make them soft. I mean, it's it's the. I, what are you talking about? It's bad weather builds character. Seeing. That's what I'm. Talking That's about. just ridiculous, Alex. <laughs> uh, I like the I like the troll, Alex. I love it. I'm a, <laughs> I, I, I'm a firm believer in. There's nothing wrong with being uncomfortable if you're at a game. You know, That's insane fun. and crazy and stupid. It's fun. It, it's what it, it's what it's all about. What you no, know? It the, isn't. the most Why iconic that? games Why? in football are played in bad weather. It, it that's the nature of the sport is bad weather. Such you know? as one of the most iconic games, for example, when the Tennessee Titans were one foot away from a Super Bowl championship, and that was in a dome. Yeah, no one remembers the greatest show on turf. I'm talking like the ice. We have call- that was because there weren't any cold. domes back then, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> not because it, it, it had anything to do with the weather. There were there was not a such thing as a dome back then. Yeah, the, well, back, the Ice Bowl was the 70s, wasn't this, it? It was the 60s. There was domes. It, the Superdome was already around. The Superdome. Uh, there's one. You got me. One. Pontiac? Wasn't that around by then? No. When was Pontiac built? The Lions didn't even <laughs> uh, exist in the 60s, Alex. <laughs> Seattle had a dome, too, right? For yeah, the Kingdome. They had the Kingdome yeah. back in the day. Not in the 60s. No, that was the 70s. The Sa- Seattle I'm, didn't come around until 72. Right. Uh but I, I'm just Th- those games had nothing to do with the weather. That's just crazy. I, I mean, it, it's it, there's no reason why you can't have eliminate weather as a factor in these things. And I don't want to sit out in the Green Bay outside in January. I'm not doing it. Yeah, anytime. Look, I, I've, experience, I've experienced the weather uh, in Wisconsin. Well, matter of fact, Green Bay exactly. I, I've experienced that weather. Uh, shout out to 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 my job. Uh, like in September. And it's that's <laughs> September, October. I I can go to a game in Wisconsin. I can go to a Green Bay game uh, in September, October. But any time past that, uh, no. Nope. Yeah, it's December and January where it it gets rough. But yeah, I'm not. The they can have that. Yeah. It, although fun r- little fact, you, you know, like dome teams in the playoffs al- always do worse, right? Like the statistically, the, like if you look at dome teams playing outdoors in the playoffs. They're like in the 100s in terms of win percentage. It, it's amazing. I world. believe it, and that's why they got to get home field advantage. <laughs> yeah. Atlanta, Atlanta made it to the Super Bowl. Uh, re- recent years, Atlanta made it to the Super Bowl by playing most of the games at home, if not all of yeah. them. Um, uh, uh, and Saints then Gre- uh, Saints, yeah, the Saints is yeah. other team I was thinking of. They played. They want. They made it to the Super Bowl uh, doing the same thing. They played all their games at home. So yeah. it is what it is. So. That would be part of my argument. Is shout out to Dallas. They're they're speaking, ass. They don't win. Teams play better outdoors than dome teams. So it I think helps. you've lost your mind. Uh, who says I had it to begin with? Well, that's uh, true. <laughs> yeah, not I. <laughs> uh, you know, th- there are other things. So I, I've never. I don't really talk about this. The the company I work for right now, uh, they built like the scoreboard in Atlanta. Uh, that's one of the things they do. That weird, I don't know if you, you don't even see it on TV, but it's like an oval-shaped scoreboard, so there's no edges on it. Uh, hmm. I, I don't need that, by the way. It, it, when I'm at a stadium, I don't need like a big jumbotron like that, personally. Uh, well, you know, this is what like I was saying. I don't really nice. care what I don't really yeah. care what these stadiums are like at all. I just want to see the team win. Well, so, you know, when we talk about the big picture of this team, and I know we're actually already, we should move on to the defensive line soon, but they've kind of tried to go a little old school with this rebrand, which is, you know, an interesting thing. And I kind of hope that that keeps up whenever they build the stadium. Don't make it feel modern. Make it feel like it will be modern, but still try and give it some kind of facade of, like, old school football is my mentality. Uh, You know, so that's just me. I I don't know. Uh, 
you know, when I look at the stadium, like, I don't want uniforms with fades on them, like the Falcons. I, I don't want some ridiculous, you know, overly modern stadium like Dallas. I, I, I want this to feel like a team that could have been around in the 30s. I mean, to me, looks are irrelevant. I just don't see, I just don't care about a lot of, th- I don't care about the way a lot of things look. I just think it doesn't really serve a functional purpose so i just don't really care as long as it's not strange and weird that's all i can really care about for me you know so just build a stadium it'll be fine who cares what it looks like that's kind of my attitude and i realize i'm a minority in that regard as long as they have hot dogs you'll be okay yeah of course if you don't have hot dogs we're gonna have a problem he just need he just needs microwavable food he'll be all right (laughs) <laughs> yeah, just microwave the hot dogs. You don't need to cook them. Just, you know, microwave them. It'll be fine. 60 seconds, I'll... man. That's all yeah, I need. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, you think you guys think I'm kidding out there? I'm not. No, I don't. Th- I, I, everyone's microwaved a hot dog. Everybody. <laughs> um, okay, we should move on to the defensive line. You know, uh, we, you know, we got to talk about the defensive line and our position group breakdown. And this was one I wrote, guys. So, you know, I'm sorry that nobody else wanted to do it. Um, so defensive line, not a lot of changes this year. Uh, specifically, we're talking defensive tackles this week. We'll talk ends next week, folks. So the team really didn't let anybody go this year, which is um, surprising when you think about it. Usually there's going to be some turnover, but uh, all their returning guys, Deron Payne, Tim Settle, John Allen, Ionitis, uh David Bada, and then there was... Devin Rowe Lawrence, who was on uh, the practice squad, and uh, you know, kind of that last guy. Uh, you know, that was it. And then they brought in two guys who were also kind of journeymen in Daniel Wise and Gabe Wright. Um, uh, to talk briefly about those, like, backup of backup guys, Gabe Wright, he's been around for a bu- about five years, I think. Uh, he was last in Jacksonville in the NFL really made his name uh, with an XFL stint. So that's the kind of guy you're looking at there. Uh, Daniel Wise uh, was with Dallas and Arizona the last two seasons on the practice squad. I I honestly don't think these guys are being brought in as competition for anything. It's, you know, you need bodies in camp. Uh, That kind of situation. Uh, We did have uh, Lawrence, who was here from last year. He came in middle of last season. Uh, he was active for one game versus Dallas, so he he got to play in a win. I guess so that's good for him. And then we have Bada, who was here last year as well. Uh, who we all pro- if you don't remember, he was the guy who came over from Germany as part of the NFL's international program. And you know Ron Rivera is big on the international stuff. Uh, you know, we've got a guy this year in Reyes like that. So B- Bada was last year's Reyes, I guess. Uh, th- and, you know, these guys get – have you guys noticed the international players always get a ton of press coverage? Uh, they're almost brought in just to be a story, it feels like to me. Well, I don't know how if Bada got a ton of press. I think there's a group of fans out there who didn't know Bada was on the team. There probably is, but uh, – Actually, you know, I didn't. <laughs> there you go, and Jamal pays more attention to this team than you know most people. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I I do remember him having like two or three video interviews on CBS and seeing him on local news and stuff like that. I think um, I think it's a nice soft news story. When yeah, I don't know if he can play football or not. We've really basically seen none of him, so who yeah, knows? Yeah, he he did, he was on the practice squad. He, even when Ionitis went down, they brought in another guy rather than put, bring him up, which is interesting. Well, I mean, does it surprise you? I mean, he never played. He didn't play college ball. He's from Germany, and you yeah, know there he was no preseason. In Germany, I think, is it? Yeah, there was no preseason. I mean, again, who knows if he can play? I mean, of this group of back, I know you're going to get to the starters here in a minute. Yeah. I mean, of this group of backup practice squad types, I mean, I guess Devereaux Lawrence is the one that, I, you know, I would have the most faith in, only because, I mean, he's hung around, managed to hang around for a while. <laughs> Yeah. You know, the rest of these guys, I, I, mean, I don't know if they can play. Daniel Wise, Gabe Bright, I mean, who knows? <laughs> They're just names to me. I haven't really watched or paid attention to them too much. But Devereaux Lawrence is the one that catches my eye because I, I, I think the coaches have slightly more faith in him than the rest. So he would be maybe the only one. 
Yeah, he'd he be was, my number said, one he was in terms. Brought in for one game last year, so yeah, he would be my number one in terms of if I have to rank these sort of back of the roster backup types. Sure. Um, I remember Gabe Wright from his. I want to say I didn't. Did Gabe Wright play in uh, Cleveland at one point too, Alex? Uh, let me. I, I, I want to say yeah. Uh, yes, he was with Cleveland. Okay, I was. I do remember there. Okay, I do remember him uh, during his time in Cleveland too. I, I did like. I don't want to overstate this, but and and what I remember of Gabe Wright, I did like what I saw. Um, this is me before him even joining the team. Like I just thought he was okay. It wasn't like he was a guy who went in there and was immediately a, immediately identified as a person who just can't can't perform mm-hmm. anything like that. I my my memory is him being okay. Um, mm-hmm. And out of the guys that that we listed just now. Um, I do have some interest in Gabe and seeing how he can. How old is he at this point? Do you have his age with you? Gabe Wright? Yeah. He's uh, 27. He'll be 27 this year. Okay, he'll be 27 this year. Yeah, he's a he's a guy I have interest in. Um, just to just to see if he can. Uh, no, if that's he, not right. He's 29. He's born in 1992. Oh, sorry. Uh, you're right. I, I was I was just counting the number of seasons he's played, and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah but okay. he hasn't played since 2018. So, okay, all right. Yes. Is so that's 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 the guy that I have interest in, uh, just to see if he can stick around uh, for Washington. Um, just because I remember off the top of my head that he was okay when I saw him when I saw him play. So I mean that's yeah. all I could really offer for these backups. But um, Gabe is Gabe. Gabe's been around. He he has some familiarity with the pro. Um, and then you said something about XFL, which is kind of interesting. Um, that may have been where I saw him. I'm not entirely too sure. Like in terms of recent memory, but. Um, yeah, I have it would have to be because, uh, like I kind of said, 2018 was the last season he played in the NFL. So, you know, it's been a couple years. Uh, well, look, I mean, none of these backups are going to get much playing time. No. Not, They're going to rotate in occasionally because you can't just leave a defensive lineman out there for the entire game. But, I mean. <laughs> They're here for preseason. The, is what they're here for. Yeah, and one or two of them will stick around, uh, you know, on the Maybe active because you have squad. to have backups. Yeah. Uh, but this team is really about the starters and the, what happens with the future, you know, of right. that group. Right. So, th- and that's why I kind of wanted to do the backups first here because this team is about the top four guys at the defensive tackle position. That's Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne, Ioannidis, and Tim Settle, of course. Uh, you really can look at all four of them. I, I think on, if you put Ionitis and Settle, who, let's say, let's just say, they're going to be the primary backups to Payne and Allen this year, in all likelihood. Unless somebody, like, upsets the apple cart. Uh, I, that might be Ionitis. Ionitis yeah, outplayed everybody. I mean, Ionitis, when you look at performance per snap, and he plays less snaps than Payne and Allen, he does more, like, he has more tackles, more sacks per, on his per snap basis than either of them. Yep. But that could also be because he's rested more. Uh, Ioannidis' big problem, of course, is that I think every other season he has some injury that takes him out for at least half the year. Right. Um, you know, so that's that's always going to be his problem. Alex hasn't been doing his job in massaging him and, you no, know, getting I, him ready for games. <laughs> that's, that's true. He's a big guy. It's a lot to massage, Steve. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, what, what else do you have to do, Alex? Come on. <laughs> um... Yeah, the, the other interesting thing about those four guys is Settle and Allen both are on contracts that technically end this year. Uh, we we know they're working on a you know big contract for Allen. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what that ends up being if they get a deal done. Like how much is he really getting paid and all that. Uh, and we'll go in that I think in a bit. But Tim Settle. You know, he's played well when he's been out there. I think he's performed very well. I think if you put him on a lesser team, he could be a starter. You know, it, like, there's a lot of teams where he would be the number one guy. So you kind of got to figure this is his last year here in D.C. You know, even though he's done a good job, uh, I, I just don't, you know, I, when you shuffle the cards and say who's getting paid, I just don't see how he sticks around. I wrote a very detailed column about this a couple Mm -hmm. months ago. Um, They could do it. 
I don't have it in front of me, but so I don't. And, uh, but in the column, I went through the details about numbers and contracts and whatnot. The only way they could get all these four of these guys signed long term, assuming they want to, because again, Settle may want may want to leave and yeah. go start. I mean, I understand that, but it, it, you could pull it off if the, each player cooperated and took less in the first year of their deal to keep the cap hit down because of the salary cap. That'd be the only way to pull it off. It's it could be done. It's very difficult and unlikely, but it could be done. I think to me, settle is probably the one that's going to be sacrificed from a contractual standpoint. Yeah, and I, I don't even know if it's a sacrifice because I think he, pro- if I were in his shoes and I was like, well, I've got these three guys in front of me and I'm good enough to go to, I don't know, what's a crappier team than us right now? Jacksonville? I, I could go to Jacksonville and be a starter. Why not go be a starter? On the other hand, though, think about this, though. Jonathan Allen contract runs this year. Right. Dron Payne contract runs this year, but he has the fifth year option, so next year. Yeah. And then Ionitis is next year. None of these guys are signed long term. Not right. a single one of them. So, you know, Settle could battle it out and beat somebody out. He would be cheaper than Jonathan Allen. Oh, absolutely. He would you know? be a cheaper option. Um but again, it's then he he still has to, in my mind, beat out Matt Ioannidis for that number three spot before Absolutely. we start talking about the number two and number one spot for him. Oh, for sure, of course. And I don't know if I'm willing to say Ioannidis is in the number three spot. Yeah. I just think he was hurt. I think he's a better player than Allen and Payne, both. Because, yeah. um, look, I mean, we like Allen because he's – I mean, Allen is a local kid, and he's he's a great character guy. He's been great for the team, solid number one. Leader. Yeah. yeah, solid first-round pick, but – Neither Allen nor Payne are at a Pro Bowl level. If if taken as you know, if compared to the rest of the NFL, they're good, but they're not great. Neither one of them. And at times, Ioannidis has outplayed them both. Yeah, I'm, Jamal, I'm you not. Sounded like you were going to say something there. Yeah, I'm not. There's a couple things. I'm not too convinced that Settle will be a starter elsewhere. Um, I don't even think he's shown that he can start here. Like I don't, I don't, I don't think he's shown that level of ability yet. Like I, I felt that he's proven that he can, you know, he can back up a starter, <laughs> which is, you know, what he's doing now. But he's doing it well. But there's a different level of starting caliber, and you also have to be able to play like 70 percent of the snaps on defense. Um, he hasn't, he hasn't done that yet. Um, so I, I don't necessarily know that he's going to be a starter elsewhere. And it don't matter if he goes to the Vikings, whoever, you know, who needs some help on the defensive line or Cincinnati. Like he may, he may just be in the rotation. And, uh, in terms of Ioannidis, I, I think that, <laughs> I think that he's good. Um, I think he's the team's best interior pass rusher, but Allen has something where we I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty confident to say he's probably the team's best interior run defender. Um so I think that they both have something going for him where when you're talking about how you're gonna pay certain guys, I would say it does get tricky. Um and you can maneuver multiple ways. Like you can opt to go in with Tim Settle and focus on signing Deron Payne down the line, or uh, like that. That can work, but I don't. It, it just does. It does get tricky when you talk about it because there's so many options, and eventually you 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 then branch out to the defensive end. So it's like you you have to take a whole bunch of things into an equation. But with Jonathan Allen, he does provide a lot of things that that can work well in DC. The leadership perspective, um, the ability on the field, like he's he's generally healthy. Um, he's had like random incidents where he's missed time, but he's generally healthy. Uh, but then you have to just evaluate, and it comes down to this: you have to evaluate: are you willing to pay a, a run defender top tier money, top five money, um, when you're not getting a fully uh, Foreign player, like he can't do everything, um, but he he can do something really good. Like, are you willing to pay him that 
that person like when the league is already transitioning to being a passing passing league can i don't i don't know i don't know and i'm glad i'm not a coach trying to make this decision because there's a variety of things to consider when you're talking about paying this defensive line and that you're talking about Allen. i mean yes (laughs) um the beauty about Allen's situation for Allen is that the team has to decide on him first. Yeah. You know, Payne, they've already exercised a fifth-year option for 2022 on. I-9 is assigned to 2022. Settle is an afterthought. Um, Allen is the guy they have to decide on first. And I don't know if the team is willing to let him go. I agree with what Jamal is saying. Do you really pay him top five or whatever money when he's limited? Uh, you know, right. in certain respects, I agree with you c- totally. But on the other hand, I don't know if the team is going to be willing to just let him walk, either. And so, so they may just sign him <laughs> because. And I want to, I want to just insert something to give him credit. Um, last last year, I give him credit in the sense that he was he did create a lot of pressure when he when he rushed the passer. It didn't show up in the sack totals, but I give him credit in that sense that he did. He did create some pressure in his in his uh, pass rushes, um, but that was one year out of what four or three, however long he's been here. So um, yeah, I want to I want to yeah. So I want to give him credit in that regard. Last year was really good for him in the pass rushing aspect, but you know it's still something to consider. Like as we move forward, trying to evaluate you know his worth here in Washington. Yeah, I mean he's not Aaron Donald, you yeah. know. <laughs> and, and that that actually I, I decided to. Th- you know, I know, Steve, you probably have a spreadsheet with every player in the NFL, but I decided to just pull up Spotrack and look at the defensive tackles. Curse you. Yes, I, I know. You, 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 you do have a spreadsheet, don't you, with all this? Uh, Aaron <laughs> Donald. and So the top guys, Donald, the top three, let's say, Donald, uh, Buckner. Top three and, is measured by what metric? Uh, I'm looking at average uh, value. I average think, annual value. Yeah, okay, average go annual, ahead. They're all over $20 million at this point. Which, that's a lot of money for a defensive tackle. Jonathan Allen, to me, he ain't a $20 million player. I don't His even... resume doesn't say it either. Hmm? He's never been to a Pro Bowl. He doesn't right. have an all-pro. So you're talking about, like, Aaron Donald is an all-pro regular. Aaron Donald might be one of the best players in the NFL's history. Aaron Donald is the best player in the NFL, he, yeah. He's best right now, but in the history of the league, he might right. end up being, like, in that Lawrence Taylor I don't think even Jonathan Allen would put himself into that category. Yeah, but what he says and what his agent might want are going to be Who different. Who are the next things. guys? You you know. So like the the real question is like so if I go to let's say the middle tier, 15, 16, that range, then we're talking about 10 million dollars a year for guys. If that's what he's looking for, I think you could make it work. Uh and that's guys like Su are making nine million. Sue, uh, who's Sue? Uh. Sue, I always say Sue. Uh. It's not Sue. Uh. Yeah. Uh, you know, come on, come on, Alex. He's he been, he been in the league long enough. You know better. I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jordan Phillips is making ten million. Uh, let's see. Most of these are names I, I don't even think are that well known. Uh, that's well, certainly Sue is not well known. Vernon Butler, seven point five. Matt Ioannidis right now is making seven point two million, two five million, which I didn't realize that he he was that high up. Um, so it is going to be interesting to see what is he really looking for salary wise, because we know that's been the problem with you know some of these other contracts like Brandon Scherf. He's looking for top dollar money, uh, and the team's not willing to pay him that because he's a guard. Uh, you know, so I'll be very curious to see what happens with. Uh, Allen in terms of what salary they're looking for because let's say he's willing to play ball and take something that's average annual value is around $10 million with where the salary cap's going. I, I think that's workable to keep him keep pain, even keep Ioannidis and still work on those defensive ends in the end. Uh, you know, like as if, but if he's looking for top, top dollar, uh, he might be gone, honestly, because he's not worth 20 million. He's not worth $15 million. He He's a above average defensive tackle. Well, I'll tell you this. Because I, I pulled up my article here. Yeah. Um, I've been through this whole exercise in a detailed fashion. And it's just 
Jonathan Allen can't get more than about ten million. It's his it, it, average annual value year. That's is all there is. Mm-hmm. The Washington cannot give him more unless they're going to dedicate a huge amount of money towards their defensive line, above and beyond what most teams do. They could make a sacrifice somewhere else, you know, and, bring, and pay all these guys huge money if they wanted. But assuming rationality and balance in your signing cap and your in your uh, salary cap, ten is about it for Jonathan Allen. If he doesn't take that, they're going to have to just let him go. You know. Somebody, somebody yeah. driving a truck? Yeah, yeah I was, was wondering what that happened. Phone. Sorry. Oh, I must say, I thought <laughs> that was the, like, big, yeah, like, the big rig uh, <laughs> honking the horn. <laughs> my, my phone is on vibrate, and it's sitting on top of something with a coffee cup. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, was a, a bit of an odd effect. noise. It was a bit of an odd noise. Um, anyway, yeah, so I get, 10 is about it for Allen. They just can't pay him more than that, realistically. Right. Um, so... Uh, you know, we'll find out. I, again, he has an advantage here because he's first, and I don't. I think Ron likes him. It, Alan doesn't. Alan have a military family background. <laughs> Am uh, I wrong in no, that? No, he was. He's adopted, isn't he? I don't think that doesn't mean he doesn't have a military either. background. <laughs> I would just say, but this. regardless, maybe I'm. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but about that, but. Ron Rivera likes him. I don't think Ron Rivera wants to let him walk. I think they're going to make an attempt to sign him to a long term deal. But they just can't pay him more. Excuse me, more than about ten million a year. It's as simple I w- as that. I would just say, sorry. I would just say that, um, wh- whatever relationship Ron has with Jonathan Allen and how he feels about Jonathan Allen, he ain't gonna be thinking about that when it comes to a contract. Um, he, he talks about him being his favorite leader or, or the best leader on the team. Um, sure, that's cool. But you have to you have to do something. Uh, more than just being a leader when it comes to money, because you can always like leaders. Leaders emerge all the time, um, and people whether it's whether it's somebody stepping up to the plate or somebody already organically being there because of the absence of that said leader who can possibly be Jonathan Allen. Somebody will replace Allen. Like that stuff happens. Now I'm not going to say that's going to happen. Like and it's going to significant like Im- immediately carry over but i'm just saying that to say i don't think no matter how much he talks about ron how much he talks about how much he loves john Athens leadership and stuff like that um i don't think that'll be one of the top it, it'll be a factor but i don't think it'll be like a top two uh of of four reasons why he signed him like i don't think it's gonna be up there uh, and you're, you're right, right, Steve. His, his dad was uh, military. I, I was wrong. His parents that's just got divorced. He, he wasn't adopted. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, and so I mean, yeah, I think Ron likes that about him. Um, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure that will play into it. You know, Ron likes guys who are going to be leaders more than anything. Uh, you but know, in like, terms of year one, yeah, ten million. Because really, they've got about ten million for Allen and Settle both. To be honest, and you could give Settle if you wanted to just let Settle walk. You could let him walk or give him a contract with a really super low right. year one cap hit, and the bulk of the ten could go to Allen. But it's if Allen is looking to get more than that, he's going to be somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Military or no military. Yeah. Uh, I. I and, and you know, I don't. It's nice that you grew up in Ashburn, but like, if you think you're worth twenty million dollars, you know that I don't. I don't think you're gonna get. That uh, he, he might not think that. We don't know. Yeah, who knows? I mean, yeah. Uh, he he has not, and no one says what they think they're worth anymore. It, it, that era of the NFL is pretty much over. I feel like when players would. Well, why would you? I mean, that's crazy. I feel don't like in that. the nineties <laughs> and early two thousands, some guys like were bargaining through the media all the time. It, at least it felt that way. And um, then people got smart and realized that was dumb and it stopped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's talk about Payne, since I think he's the only other guy that we really haven't touched on at this point. Uh, he's been improving steadily each year. I don't think, uh, you, you know, it's going to be tricky to see. I feel like he and Allen both had down years last year, transitioning out of this 3 4 to a 4 3. Um, and I know it's not a big difference like it used to be, but I think it was big enough where, um, you know, I think their numbers across the board were down for both of them. Um, I know Allen had only two sacks last year, and he had eight the year before. Uh, I think Payne was similar. But the thing I like when I see Payne play is he'll have those plays occasionally where he just can completely collapse the interior line. Uh, he doesn't do it every play, and no one does anymore. Uh, except for maybe Aaron Donald. 
but he just completely can wreck a you know guard in a center uh, in the right situation more than anybody else on this roster in my mind. He, that's probably where his best talent is, and that's great in run stuffing. That's great in you know disrupting a pass play. Um, but again, now you're talking two years from now, we're going to have to figure out his contract. He'll make more than Allen, in my mind. But that, that's another discussion. Um, yeah, if you go forward to 2023 here, um, I mean, I think at that point, Allen's cap it is going to go up to about 12, assuming they sign Allen. And so then, really, we're talking about... I mean, you've got to have Payne go super low in year one to make it work. You know, sure. so you got – I'm saying Payne in, in the four to five million for year one and then have his cap hit go up dramatically in year two to around 12. Right. Again, I think that Payne, to me, is more of an impact player than Allen on the field in many ways. Yeah. But they're in sort of the same rough contractual boat. You need to have both of those guys in the 10 to $12 million range to make it work. If it's any more free than one of them, it really doesn't work, money-wise. Right. And, and, you know, you say he's impactful. I, I would say the same thing about him that I would say about Ioannidis. Both of them can have spurts of impactfulness, impactfulness where they will blow up, you know, two or three plays in a row. But you, they only maybe give you that twice a game. Uh, it, it's not like there's a constant menace with these guys. Um, well, and and also, I mean, don't forget, people are, I think, having a bit of a sunshine and roses look at what happened last year with this defense. You know, they, they're ranked number, you know, they were... Uh, Fourth in points, up, second in yards, something like that. Well, yeah, okay, but they were 11th in rushing. You know, 4.2 yards per, per carry, which is good, but not great. Uh, you, know, you know, their passing defense at time looked atrocious. Sure. Atrocious. At, awful at times. And so I think we're getting a little bit of a optim- more optimistic view than what actually happened last year. They were inconsistent. They needed help at times. They did get better to their credit. But it was not the 85 Bears for 16 games last year. They do need help, and they still need to improve. Absolutely. And, and I think you'll – but I do think you'll, you know – you would admit that, uh, other than Tampa Bay, who just kicked everybody's butts, uh, those last couple games, that defense really did take a step forward. From what um, Yeah, they got better. They, they did get better. Uh, I felt like they were consistent. I, I, don't, I don't know, man. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's tough to assess because that the Carolina game was bad. The Seattle game was bad. Um the Pittsburgh jump, they, they settled in quite well. Like Pittsburgh, all they do is pass, so it's like you, you kinda had to accept that and they were good in doing that. But um just I'm talking about the later the latter end of the season. And technically, I mean when before Burrow got hurt, Cincinnati, like they were they were doing okay. So it's 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 much more in depth than what the number like the statistics show is because Seattle again like they were popping off 40, 50 yard runs against this See, uh, Carolina. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say that they were moving the ball like at will, but they had their moments where it's like there's no way in hell that they just broke off a 40 plus yard play in this situation. Like they did it two or three times. Um, and it kind of reminded us of the identity of the team or the defense uh, or the vulnerability because they led the league last year defense the the defense did like in in 50 plus yard plays given up like it was just it was still there at the end yeah. of the season I think you're right and and if you look at the last couple of games like you talked about they gave up 181 yards on the ground to Seattle and then 167, uh, 113 to Carolina, but Carolina won a good team. And the last game of the season was the Eagles. And remember, they pulled Jalen Hurts in favor of right. somebody. I can't even remember who in the last – Nate uh, like, Sutfeld. Nate Sutfeld. Yeah, it were, yeah, yeah, it was Sutfeld. And and the Eagles stunk. The Eagles weren't a good team either. So, um, it, you know, in the 49er game, you know, week 14 was a weird weather game, remember, and um, bad weather game. So, I – I guess that's sort of supporting my my view of 
people are taking a little bit of a optimist of a more sunshine and rose of view of what really happened last year with this defense and all that to tie it back to defensive line. They got gashed in the middle at times, people. We even with Allen and Payne in there, they got gashed on the ground at times. Directly in the middle, they got beat one on one. So I don't think they should spend an inordinate amount of money. Yes, I'd like Allen and Payne back, but not at a huge, gig- ginormous cost. Hey, I'm okay. I, I don't, I don't disagree. They gotta find a way to make it work to get at least uh, one of these guys here. So they can't lose both. But I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, well, and I would even say one of the three because I, I feel like honestly, you keep Ionitis, it's probably not as big of a difference. I, I, the drop off between those three is very small in terms of quality of play uh, when they're on the field. It's, it's going to be tricky to see who they really keep. Because the one thing we, you know, I touched on this just a little bit. These three, all three of our top defensive tackles, they were drafted to be defensive end, nose tackle, three, four guys. Yeah. You know, like, and that scheme fit thing, you know, people say it doesn't matter, but it does a little bit. Jonathan Allen was really, really good as a three, four defensive end. Uh, You know, like that's where his big numbers came from. He didn't have a good year last year. Uh, Deron Payne, I guess he was kind of more of a nose, so, uh, you know, it's not probably not as big of a transition to be from nose to defensive tackle, but... I think it's fair, to, and, and this has to do with where they line up, by the way, in case anybody's yeah. wondering and you haven't figured this out out there. I mean, I know Alex and Jamal know, but, you know, the 3-4 defensive end is going to line up slightly, is going to line up to the inside of where the 4-3 defensive tackle is, you right. know, depending on the scheme and whatnot. But I, I look, I, to wrap it up, I, I think realistically Washington will probably sign two of those three long-term and one will be gone. Yeah. And I think Allen, because he's just first – on the schedule, by virtue of his expiring contract, they'll probably re-sign Allen, unless his contract demands are just outrageous. So I think it'll probably be one of Payne or Ioannidis, realistically, that's probably gone. Probably. And, and, you know, just by virtue of, hey, this is a first-round pick, you're going to prioritize those guys. You know? Realistically, yeah, probably. Yeah. Right. Because it always looks bad when you let a first-round pick walk after his contract. Especially when he goes somewhere else and does well. Yeah. And that's the one thing. These guys will go elsewhere and do pretty well. None of them have played poorly. I think we're real. It, it might sound like we're being negative at times, but we're nitpicking fairly small things in their game. You know, it, it's more of a, well, you're not a superstar, even though you're a first round pick. You're just a good player. They've been good, but not great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think that kind of wraps up defensive ends. Uh, it's going to be, it's a solid group. Uh, it's probably the strongest point on this whole defense, uh, you know, just in terms of depth and quality, uh, even more so than end. You know, people like to put the whole line together, but we really only have two good defensive ends now. So, um, you know, defensive tackles really the, the strength of strengths here. So uh, that should wrap us up this week because we're well over our artificial time. Thank you guys for listening this week. Uh, tune in next week. We're going to go over uh, Chase Young and Montez Sweat and then a bunch of dudes. And that'll be the next position group breakdown. <laughs> Hopefully there's more that we can actually talk about with the team, though, because uh, I, I do hate this part of the season where absolutely nothing goes on. All right. Later, guys. All right. Peace.